Hello, hello and welcome to Friday Happy Hour. I'm Amanda Farmer and you are here on the Your Strata Property Facebook page, ready to enjoy happy hour after a busy week. I hope, I wonder, it has certainly been a busy week for me. I tell you what, it's been crazy. I'd love to hear how you guys are feeling out there, strata managers, committee members. Has it been a little bit crazy? Has it been busy? I have been uh, this week involved in some tribunal litigation, putting uh, a couple of applications together in relation to dysfunctional owners corporations, as we call them in New South Wales. So that has uh, taken up a bit of my attention. I actually had a general meeting for my own building here today. We got together to pass that very important resolution to approve electronic meetings. That happened in our basement garage today. We were going to do it out in the back garden, but uh, it has been a bit wild and wet here in Sydney and freezing, really freezing. I got my winter woolies on today. And as I said in my email, I have a warming red here with me for happy hour. So I would be very interested to hear if you have brought a beverage to happy hour, what you have today. You might have a coffee. You might have an OJ. You might have a gin and tonic. Let us know if you have gone to the effort of preparing a very special cocktail for our happy hour. Uh, yes, so a general meeting for my building today. We were social distancing in the basement garage. We had about eight of us there and we are a 37 lot building so um, reasonable turnout probably a little bit less than what we would usually get uh, and that meeting as I said was especially to pass that very important resolution to enable us now to have meetings other than in person so excited to do that uh, as I do I would love to welcome you guys to pop a note in the comments section to say hello to let me know that you are here I can see lots of you here already you are coming in faster and faster for Friday happy hour. You uh, must have it in your diaries. You are ready to go. You're excited. You uh, Perhaps if you're in Sydney, you're uh, happy to be inside and away from that cold weather. Uh, hi, Gary. Good to see you. I'm getting an all good. And uh, I have to look closely here, Gary. Is it a wink or a smiley face? Uh, I think it's a wink. I'm going to put you up on the screen, Gary. There we go. Now I can see it. It is a wink. All good. Nice to see you, Gary. I am also seeing Bruce. How are you going? He's got a kombucha too cool Bruce and you're in Blackheath <gasps> snow yes you guys are due for some snow I heard that uh my dear Michelle who works with me is heading over to the other side of the mountains today and she told me that they were expecting some snow which is really exciting snow at 1am in Blackheath Chris hello he is drinking a little creature's pale ale I'm gonna I'm going to be really dexterous here today. I'm going to try and put everybody's comments up on the screen where I can, but they are coming in fast now. Hi to David. Good to see you. Uh, Ro is uh, commenting on the NCAT litigation I referred to. Do tell, do tell, cannot. It's called solicit a client privilege, Ro. Of course, that is all uh, uh, not yet disclosed. We will see. Hey, Carol, good to see you. There we go. Michelle, I just mentioned you, Michelle. Hello from Mount Victoria. She is there. She is on her way. Let us know if you're expecting some snow. Uh, I say hi to Edward. Uh, I, I am not that good at pressing these buttons and welcoming you and talking at the same time. So I'm going to stop doing that. But hello, Edward. Hello, Michelle. Happy Friday. It is freezing in Canberra. When it's freezing in Canberra, I realize it is freezing in Sydney. So that is what we all have to look forward to. Um, Chris said we're hanging out for a drink. Is that your response, Chris, to why you're all here right on four o'clock? I'm your excuse. I'm your excuse now for Friday happy hour. Oh, I have to tell you guys something funny. I was just in my kitchen because I'm here in my home office. I was just in my kitchen uh, and my son, my seven-year-old, son said to me mum I, I thought you were going on your video meeting and I said I am sweetie and he said but mum you're pouring yourself a wine and I said yet yeah, it's it's a wine meeting um and he sort of looked at me and went right is that what she's doing now okay mum's always up to something a little bit strange so I know how you feel Chris it is a Friday it is that time of the week 
Hello to Grant, great to see you. And Grant is giving us a little hint, a, a little sneaky hello to our special guest who is absolutely coming up. I will be introducing our special guest very soon. Uh, PK is the man indeed. Hi to Neville, hey Petra. Uh, Petra's got the red wine going too, awesome. Nathan, happy Friday, it is freezing. He's got his slippers on and whiskey in hand. Nathan, awesome, you are kicking back, relaxing, ready to go. Hi, James. How are you? Hi, Sam. Good to see you as well. Roy, Mark. Uh, Mark's got the hot chocolate. Do you know, did you just see me do that? That's because my glass of wine is in the way of the comments and I just, yeah, uh, a large one. Uh, hello to Henry. Hello to Joe. Excellent. So good to see you. I just realized I moved away from my mic too. That's um, not going to be all that helpful. Great. So what has been happening around the country this week, guys? What updates do I have for you? I have an update from Queensland. Uh, I am aware that Queensland now has a bill before their parliament, which will see some changes implemented to their body corporate legislation. We do have a link for you. I'm going to ask the lovely, lovely Rochelle to pop in a link to Frank Higginson's summary of the changes that are coming about in Queensland specific to COVID, if I haven't already said that, changing some of the ways that the body corporates can operate in Queensland. Interestingly, not dealing with electronic meetings. Um, that is something that's coming about with your new uh, strata legislation generally, but this particular change, uh, COVID emergency measures, is not going to deal with um, electronic meetings. You're going to deal with things like budgets and being able to alter budgets, being able to change the due dates for levies, being able to change the way that interest is charged on levies, dealing with levy recovery proceedings, dealing with borrowing. So have a look there at the link Rochelle is putting into the, the uh, comments if you're in Queensland and interested in that bill. This is something that has come about because uh, a few weeks before we got it in New South Wales, Queensland got some regulation making powers, uh, enabling the um, legislature to make these changes to body corporate legislation to deal with the COVID emergency. So um, we have the same powers now in New South Wales to make changes to make certain regulations under our Strata Schemes Management Act to deal with certain things. Uh, I think the hope is that we'll be able to deal with electronic meetings and being able to give permission to those buildings who may not yet have passed the resolution to actually uh, hold electronic meetings or meetings other than in person. Um, we're still waiting on our draft regulations. And as always, on a Friday, I put the call out there to you guys to let me know if you've got any updates on that. We have some clever cookies who tune in here on a Friday and keep us all up to date. Uh, strata managers who are in tune, in touch with what's going on around the country. Uh, if you have updates for us as well, please do feel free to share those. Uh, I do also have a link to the Queensland bill, the actual bill, if you want to go look at it. it it's a COVID emergency measures bill, so it's got reference to all different legislation. Um, but I understand that is where the provisions are that will uh, amend the Queensland body corporate legislation. Legislation. So Rochelle will pop the link in to the comments for that bill as well. Um, what else has happened this week? What may you have seen some comments on in uh, my social media feeds in particular? Well, we heard from uh, Safe Work Australia, I think was the report, not uh, the state-based Safe Work, but Safe Work Australia reversed its guidelines on Wednesday, saying that there is now no requirement to provide four square metres of space per person in lifts. Um, interesting statement. I, I'm not sure that there ever has been a requirement to provide four square metres of space per person in lifts. Um, Safe Work in particular is talking about commercial buildings where the owners, the operators in those buildings, including owners' corporations, will have 
uh, workplace health and safety obligations and of course really important considerations there about what should be happening when it comes to social distancing. Um, but Safe Work apparently had a guideline that said must have four square metres of space in lifts and that was a real concern around the country where people were coming back to work or due to come back to work. Are we going to have these massive lines in our offices, office buildings, people trying to get up and only being able to go in one, maybe two if you're lucky at a time. So Safe Work is now saying no, it's okay to uh, not observe that four square metres of space, but of course, encouraging the practice of social distancing as much as possible to keep everybody safe. So that was an article in the AFR this week, which I think I posted on uh, this Facebook page, uh, a link to that one. And uh, of course, the other exciting thing that we have heard, uh, again, in New South Wales, that is where I am, guys. Uh, and that is what the news that first comes to me. As I say, you are welcome, please, to share your news with me from across the country. From the 1st of June, we will be able to do some regional travel. How exciting. We'll be able to go on a holiday uh, reasonably locally, no interstate travel yet. Um, I would love to hear if you're excited about that. I'm a little bit excited. Uh, I tend to travel quite a bit. The last few years, my family and I have gone overseas, uh, been to Europe uh, most years, been lucky enough, and the US. And of course, that's not happening this year. So to hear that we might be able to go um, maybe to the Blue Mountains, maybe we'll get some snow when we do that, uh, maybe to be able to to go south uh, south coast north coast enjoy and be able to support our uh, tourist areas would be great so uh, we do have an article that just explains from uh, the new south wales government what those changes are that we should all be expecting from the first of june and we'll pop that one in the links for you i am just going to head back here to my comment screen and see who else has come in welcome welcome hello to Tony, good to see you, Tony. How are you doing? Tony from Adelaide. Yes, uh, I have seen you popped up in my LinkedIn recently, Tony. Uh, I can't remember what that was, but um, I, I noted you as one of our few uh, South Australian uh, connections and, and followers and supporters uh, of our uh, strata sector here. Um, thank you, Rochelle, for putting those links in. Hey, Sean B, good to see you. And I say Sean B because we have about three Seans who regularly tune in and I will see them all soon, I am sure. Uh, hi, Deb. Hi to Natalie, who was trying to convince her mum to knit her a jumper. Let us know how that goes. Uh, all right, okay, we've got some back and forth going on there. I shall come back and check that out. Apologies for I keep moving my head away from my microphone, but as I said earlier, I have uh, a suitably large glass of wine in front of my screen here, and instead of moving the wine, I'm moving my head. So I'll um, work that out, guys. Uh, but of course, you are here to meet to see, to connect with, to say hello, because it has been far too long, to our very special guest. And our special guest is Paul Keating. With over 35 years experience in insurance and financial services, Paul co-founded Strata Community Insurance in March 2014 and is the company's managing director. Prior to this, Paul spent eight years as Managing Director at CHU and BCB and 13 years at Zurich Financial Services. And Paul has worked in global insurance markets, including UK, US, Europe, Asia and the Middle East. Paul holds an Executive MBA from the University of New South Wales and is a Senior Associate of the Australian and New Zealand Institute of Insurance and Finance. Paul is also a Fellow of the Australian Institute of Company Directors and an Associate Fellow of the Australian Institute of Management. Now, Paul has been a past podcast guest. We spoke all the way back in July 2018. It was episode 119 of the podcast, if you want to check that out. And we spoke about practical tips for reducing risk in strata. And this conversation about risk has never been more important than in the current climate. So I am very excited to welcome in my special happy hour guest for today, Paul Keating from Strata Community Insurance. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Amanda. It's good to be here. 
It is lovely to have you here, Paul. And uh, look, I said that there are, I'm sure there are so many watching this video who are happy to see you uh, live, to see you in person, because I know that we often see each other at conferences, at events, uh, often conferences that you and SCI are organizing. You put on some really fabulous uh, forums a few times a year with great speakers. And we're all missing that, I think. And so it's great to have you here and sharing your wisdom as you do so well thank you very much yeah no pleasure to be here yeah it's it's a it's a it's been a challenging challenging time for everyone but you you, you kind of get to reflect a little bit on the things that you value and i'm in this business because of people and uh you, when you take that away it's it's kind of a big hole so i'm looking forward to the relaxation and restrictions and getting back connected with everyone so yeah, and I know, uh, I don't think I recognised or appreciated enough how much that in-person connection really fills me up too because I always describe myself as an introvert. Uh, I love being in my own space. I love being in my own head. And then when I do go to week-long week conferences or a few days, uh, I do need to have that downtime afterwards. Uh, but when you take that away completely and you don't have that social interaction, whether it's it's a Friday afternoon drink, so whether it is a big conference, um, you do miss it and you do recognise that um, you need that balance, you need that that other side as much as you may otherwise like to be in your own space. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm slightly on the introverted side as well, um, so I, I get what you say about the energy that it, that it burns, um, but it's a big part of what we do and, you know, despite our industry being based around regulation, um, there's a lot of uncertainty, so we're you know, we have to be talking, collaborating all the time to get, you know, better answers for people and, and help them on their journey. So um, mm. that's what, you know, as I said, that's why I love this industry so much. Yeah. And speaking of people, my understanding is that SCI now, notwithstanding you co-founded it um, for, uh, back in only 2014, uh, you've now got around 90 employees working in five different locations across the country. Um, I try to wrap my head around how does a company like yours manage or how, how did it manage this major shift? How did you get everybody set up working from home? Uh, how has this reshaped your thinking perhaps around a traditional office setup? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, um, particularly exacerbated a little bit locally because I just signed a new lease for a, a new building in North Sydney. So <laughs> just going into Christmas time. So with this on, we're, we're kind of got two properties now and no one in either of them. Mm -hmm. um, but look, we set up our business from day one to be able to work independently of servers, independently of browsers. Um, all I wanted was for our staff to be able to access uh, the information they needed to access and do business, whether they're out in the strata manager's office, uh, with a broker, wherever they are, that they could do that with their laptop at that point in time. Um, I guess what was surprising about that journey, though, was uh, everyone kept on turning up to the office as we grew the, the power of the collaboration and the learning and development that come with that. Um, people crave that social side. They, they crave that, that um, opportunity for, for learning. And uh, that's what the office environment does uh, bring. That's what the Strata community brings more broadly. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the piece that's kind of missing a little bit at the moment. So, um, but... Yeah, so from an infrastructure point of view, pretty good. Mm. I think from a, a people point of view, um, some initially thrived in it, uh, some struggled. Um, I struggled, I have to say, <laughs> in the early days. It took, took me a while to find a bit of a rhythm there, particularly for my young <laughs> my young daughter uh, homeschooling and what do I know about that? And, and <laughs> her, her, you know, turn around and she's disappeared off to, to raid the cupboard and do something else and... But, but, you know, we're in a, a situation that's not life or death. We're, we're, we're managing, uh, playing our role in a pandemic, um, lowering the spread and, and trying to avoid um, a situation. You know, it's not as grave as, as it could have been, uh, mm. this, this type of virus. So I'm very, very proud of my staff, the way they reacted. Um, production's been good. Um, but, of course, the people who crave the, the I guess, that social side are... Um, 
are really looking forward to getting back together in an office environment, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're definitely going to get into some unique issues that uh, I think, um, from my perspective outside, standing outside of uh, uh, the insurance space, let's say, as a, as a different provider to the sector that I've been seeing you guys uh, perhaps have to deal with and answer some questions you might not have had to think about before. Um, and we will absolutely get into those. Uh, and I think, as you say, Paul, the, the key to this shift is really um, flexibility, I think, and having the option, which you'll see some businesses, and it sounds like yours is one of them, have always had to work flexibly, to work remotely, to have the systems in place so that when you are forced, to do that, you don't have a choice, then you can move quite sh quite smoothly across to that new way of working. Um, and that's definitely, um, my business has benefited from that with a, a real focus to online work. Um, we found that shift a bit easier. And businesses, I think, who are learning this time around that having the, a lack of that flexibility is putting them on the back foot are now able to implement that and to make sure that they're raring to go next time. Yeah, look, I, I think 100% right, but it's also given businesses time to think a little bit too about how they better that they improve that and how they approach it because this is I think this has been a good trial run because it, the super bug that we've always been talking about could have been a lot worse than than coronavirus and yep. so you know I think we'll be better prepared for sure. Now, I am just going to hop over to our comments here because we have a lot more people coming through uh, and we have some updates, I think, from around the country. Uh, Tony is saying that South Australia has opened up regional travel also, which is great, particularly after Corona hit in the Barossa previously. Yeah. Okay. Very good to know, Tony. I cannot wait until we can travel interstate. Uh, I am seeing Sean who says New South Wales also has from 1 June, 50 in pubs if four square metres is able to be complied with. 50. Okay, it's the first time I've seen that number. Is that something that's come out today, Sean? I've had my head in NCAT applications. I've missed that one. Um, very exciting. Cool. Hey, there we go. And there's Natalie Fitzgerald saying, not going to lie, that's really exciting. Um, look, I'm forgetting to do my job here. Rochelle is going to um, poke me over here and say, Amanda, put the comments up on the screen. There we go. Thank you very much, Sean, for that. And Natalie, I am also excited indeed. Hi Emiliana, good to see you. Patricia, uh, you are most welcome for the invitation to join Happy Hour. Um, some of you will be on my email list and will get emails on Friday afternoon letting you know that Happy Hour is happening. Others uh, are seeing it on Facebook. If you're not on the email list and you want to be, you will not just get invites to Happy Hour, you will get the weekly podcast where you will hear from very uh, uh, excellent strata experts just like our expert all here today uh, you head over to your strataproperty.com.au and if you sign up for either one of the free ebooks that you'll see there on the home page you will be in you will be on that list and you'll be getting your invite in your inbox to happy hour and anything else that is going on in the strata world that i can help you with uh I am seeing Anne. Hello, Anne. Good to see you. Hi, Megan. And hi, Zlata. Wonderful to welcome you all in. Now, I promised them, Paul, and I, I gave you a heads up. We are going to talk about strata insurance and we're going to answer some tricky questions. And I can tell you they're tricky because Paul and I made an arrangement to actually get on this call a little bit earlier and start working out how we're going to answer these questions. So um, that is that is the joy of strata insurance, isn't it, Paul? 100%. 100%. All righty. Now yeah. let's Let's deal with uh, the, these COVID impacts. Uh, what have you been seeing when it comes to the pandemic? How has it impacted the strata insurance sector? Uh, is there more concern about risk? What kind of questions is your team seeing come through from managers and from owners? Yeah, look, um, I, I guess I'll just take a broader approach. I mean, COVID, I, I have to say that I've been very pleased with the way in which the strata management industry overall um, with blunt tools, can I say, because there's been restrictions, have have kind of reacted to support their um, their owners, co corporations, and the, the executives they're dealing with, uh, because it's it's been unknown. It's a challenging time, and you're dealing with cohabitational property, right? By its very nature, you, you're talking about lots of people getting together to live and to spare spend their spare time, and then we add government in saying, okay, we're going to lock you in. 
um, to this facility, and but also we want you to keep a safe distance. So it's been challenging around rules, and you've seen it all around, you know, pools and gyms and common f f facilities. The the what you talk about lifts, how many people can get in the lift, all those issues. I think the strata management industry has supported, you know, their clients, the owners, exceptionally well in that in that period. From an insurance perspective, um, yes, there's been some. Um, some uh, some questions come around uh, around insurance coverage, particularly from owner investors, mm -hmm. as to uh, well, my tenant moved out and I've got loss of rent, so can I claim you know loss of rent from that? Well, the the answer is not no because it's not a landlord's policy. There's a different type of insurance for that, um, and yes, we do have a loss of rent benefit, but that's generally um, triggered by a, an insurable event that comes through. Um, I think the general insurance industry, it's important to say that pandemics generally have essentially been excluded from most insurance coverage since about 2002. I think it was the SARS event that mm. introduced that. And that that's followed reinsurers around the world globally shutting down that coverage um, because of their inability to measure the impact and to kind of uh, price that into a, into a, a sensible risk that um that is affordable for for people across a whole range of classes of insurance um so you know uh, i guess the you know in in residential strata policies there's been a you know a benefit for um perhaps a building that has been quarantined for because of an infectious disease and people can't get in i.e locked out of the building <laughs> this is a little bit unique where government's kind of encouraging us to be inside a building so um and and on the commercial side yes there's uh you know the, there's a COVID exclusion and and people are saying that it's vague and and maybe sorry not a COVID exclusion pandemic exclusion that's a little bit vague um and those issues are being worked through but that's the general approach of most insurers mm. are you yet feeling the or, or, or hearing the fallout um from a financial perspective are you hearing about affordability no when it comes to premiums yeah that's that's the big thing Amanda um, uh, yes we are seeing it and it's it's real um, mm. and and insurance is just one of the number of of uh, I guess some um, purchases that a owners corporation need to need to make uh, and yeah they're feeling the pinch and and the uncertainty of people being stood down um, mm. in massive numbers at a very very quick time mm. uh, has, has raised those alarms. And, and of course, you know, COVID, the pandemic will come and go and we're, we're coming on the other side of that, but the economic impact, and we've been talking a lot about this internally, the economic impact is going to be enduring. Um, you know, we are in a recession and there will be consequences and finances and credit is, is all the implications that are associated with the recessions are yet to, the recession is yet to play out. Um, so we, we wanna be very, very empathetic to that um, financing insurance coverage. If you've got an asset, you definitely, you know, it's the reason it's legally required to purchase is, you know, make sure you protect that asset. Um, you know, so there are funding arrangements, for example, that, that can be looked at mm -hmm. um, through, um, we, we have installments that we offer to strata managers and owners corporations, um, insurance brokers have premium funding. Uh, there's lots of ways to try and help finance um, people through that, um, that period. Yeah, that is good to know. Uh, and, and even setting aside the uh, COVID uh, added pressures that have come about because of COVID, um, insurance premiums we, I've been hearing and seeing from clients, from strata manager clients for a long time, have been going, get, going higher and higher and, and some buildings finding it really hard to get uh, more than one quote for their scheme. Uh, there seemed to be a tightening of the market there. Have you got any insight into that that you can share with us, Paul? No, it's, it's, it's what, what you've heard is spot on, Amanda, 100%. Mm. In actual fact, if you recall, I think you, we talked about it in 218, um, mm. that the, the nature of the benevolence of paying out all these claims would, would ultimately come back into insurance premiums, and that's what you're seeing. Mm. And I think it has definitely been exacerbated by building quality we, we've seen that the you know we, we've talked about building defects but the that is exacerbating the cost of uh reinstatement mm. so when a when a legitimate event happens and there's damage caused we come to repair people remove stuff all of a sudden they find 
other problems, the concept patents, other problems, and um, you know, making that building compliant um, has resulted in the cost of that claim being far greater than it otherwise should be. And that comes back to be reflected in premiums. Yes, and I think we talked about as well in that podcast episode, thank you for reminding me, um, about the claims on legal defence policies, which is really where I uh, have my interaction with insurers uh, and how I was always quite, I have been quite fascinated at often how easy it is to get a payout on a legal defence policy. Um, and as you say, that that benevolence, that ease of access, that um, paying claims that otherwise maybe if we looked a little bit more closely at the fine print, uh, maybe wouldn't have been paid out. Uh, is that, yeah, coming back to bite us now with higher premiums? And are we seeing, I'd love to hear from the managers, are you seeing that it is harder to get those claims paid out now than it was, say, two years ago? Yeah, I, well, I think it's it's tight enough from what I've heard, um, mm. and 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 again, we're 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 trying to focus a lot on um, making sure that we can get through legitimate claims very very quickly. So you 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 we have this this judgment all the time. There's 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 genuine events and genuine damage. Mm. There's genuine events and what I call questionable damage. That's where the whole maintenance issue gets and previous defects and other non-disclosed issues gets mm. all muddy. And then of course, you have this percentage that say, well, I've got damage, I know it's maintenance, but I'm gonna have a crack at insurance anyway. So those those problematic areas suck up most of the resources in our claims teams, trying to work through that to get a fair outcome for not only the, the stakeholders from the insurance side, but also of course the claims history, that body corporate, that owner's corporation is gonna wear in into the future. And that's going to cause their premiums to rise as well. So, you know, we, we love genuine events, genuine claims is easy. We, we want to get through that as quickly yeah, as possible. It it's the other side that, that takes a lot of time. Mm, very interesting. I am just heading back over to the comments to uh, re respond to some hellos here and also some questions already. Uh, this is an excellent question here from Chris. Uh, hi, Paul. What is the biggest misconception people have regarding strata insurance what causes the most heartbreak hmm. oh i think the biggest one uh is that we bought insurance so therefore it covers everything and uh or like an, a potentially another example where my um you know air conditioning unit we're talking about this early uh doesn't work anymore uh can i claim it on insurance um Insurance is not a maintenance policy. You know, it is it is about fortuitous uh, accidental damage, if I can use that broader broader term. And uh, there are it, there it is finite. There are boundaries around it. So there is cut. There, there are ins and outs. It's a contract, and it has boundaries around it. So um, a lot of people go, oh, "Yeah, we've got insurance, uh, therefore it must be covered." Or alternatively, we find a lot of people go, we've got insurance, so let's have a crack at it. Mm. Uh, ultimately, what our people are doing, they're trying to get a fair outcome by um, making sure that we uh, are paying all those legitimate claims that we expected, um, have uh, allowed for, have uh, fall well within the contract. And we do that quickly and fast. Um, mm. And then we, we've just kind of got to sort out these maintenance dressed up as accidental damage issues. So I'd say that that's that's a community issue too. It's not just restricted to strata. Um, you know, that's just a society issue where people perceive insurance is um, as something there to have a crack at. Yeah, and perhaps not having that long-term view of how is this going to affect not just my premium but the industry as a whole um, and, yeah, making those claims, attempting to make those claims that are just ultimately not legitimate. Yeah, and, and I think also too, if I just contrast it very quickly, Amanda, like, I think the greatest contrast is in the US where owners corporations over there and I'll, I'll, um, I'll, the, the equivalent community associations, essentially, you know, they run it much differently. They, they have very large deductibles and self-insured retentions and they say our insurance is just the catastrophic events, the big losses, the big fires or the big storms um, cyclones, um, that's what they use it for. So mm -hmm. the day-to-day, -day, they've worked out that it's actually cheaper for them to finance and pay for 
accidental claims, small accidental claims themselves, rather than try and put it through insurance because of yep. the added on costs. Mm. And, and I'll talk about some of those cost factors later on when we when we get to it. Yeah, um, you mentioned there, Paul, as well, that issue of air conditioning. And we were talking about a particular question that was posted on the page earlier today. Uh, it was posted by Neville, and I think I did see you here, Neville, uh, about, uh, look, I won't guess, I'll go over and actually look at the uh, question itself so I put it correctly. Uh, which insurance policy would cover the repair of an air conditioning unit? Uh, and Neville, you gave a little bit more background, I think, in a further post um, that this, these were uh, with an air conditioning system servicing the entire block um, that had been there, as I understand it, since inception. Uh, and you're mentioning there the repair of the air conditioning unit. So Paul might have given us some hints already about that one. Uh, did you want to say anything more directly in response to Neville's question there, Paul? No, we'll have a chat about it. So, so the first thing, everything's different, right? So there's not a just a simple answer. Um, and, and, and it depends. So in this case, uh, when someone says to me, I've had to pay, who covers the cost of repair? My question is, well, what's caused the damage? Is the air conditioning 15 years old and it's just a maintenance issue and a repair has had to happen? That's expected. That's part of what the sinking funds are there to, um, to say for is the replacement of this equipment and the maintenance of that over a period of time. Mm. Uh, you know what? It's cheaper, it's still more effective to push it through using the funds from the sinking fund than it is to push it through insurance. Mm. Um, yep. So uh, if it's common property, um, you know, a, a standard strata, residential strata insurance policy will cover for fusion. And most policies has an op have an option for a cover known as machinery breakdown that could also cover um, uh, air conditioning facilities, assuming again, that's common property. But it, it can vary. Then you can have, as you know, bylaws that sort of talk about who's responsible for repairs and maintenance, and and it, and and so it can get complicated depending on the facts. Yeah, absolutely. You, you've you've covered most of the points I wanted to make there, Paul, which is really it, it, it's an it depends answer, which is always frustrating, uh, but is so often the case in strata. What do the bylaws say? Uh, is it lot property? Is it common property? When did the system go in? What is it that's caused um, the problem or the damage to the system? Um, but very good question. And I'm sure that's a common one that mm -hmm. our managers are facing as well. Uh, I'm just heading over again to um, continue with my hellos because I've seen Sean, Sean M has come on in. Hello. Glad that you made it. Uh, I'm seeing a comment here from Bill and Ben, which I will put on the screen. I think this arises, uh, Paul, I referred to experts. I referred to you as an expert and my fellow expert guests on uh, the podcast. And uh, Bill and Ben is making the very good point. Uh, the expertise is based on two things, recognized field of study and expertise gained through experience is the rest of that comment, uh, if you can't see it. So yes, indeed. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Bill and Ben. Uh, okay, I am just scrolling through for some more questions. Uh, Sean is saying it was only announced today. That would be the uh, 50 people in the New South Wales pubs from the 1st of June, assuming that we can manage the four square metre rule. So uh, our bigger pubs, I imagine there, that is going to be happening. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Natalie is saying, yes, in terms of claims, uh, as it should be have advice for some years now to keep to major expense claims only and let the small stuff go. Very good advice from an experienced strata manager there. Uh, Chris is saying today is gold. Insurance is not a maintenance policy. Yep, we all need reminding of that. Uh, hi, Melissa, who has just come in. Uh, awesome. Okay, great. Um, I thought that I saw, I hope I didn't skip a uh, question or maybe it's coming up. Uh, question from Tony, perhaps. Hi, Paul. I assume the lack of general knowledge about the costs involved in reinsurance would be a large hurdle with the general community and strata also, question mark. Yeah, look, look. I, th I think overall the cost, it, it, and the cost of insurance is not really well understood. And I, I think I've been talking about this for a number of years. I think transparency around the various components um, w would be a great thing. So mm -hmm. uh, reinsurance, just to, to give people an idea, is probably about a third of the cost overall of what an insurer would pay. Uh, generally, if you split it in three, so you've got 
um, a third of your cost for claims. So if you claims 30%, uh, reinsurance 30%, um, administrative expenses, um, your people, systems, um, commissions, other cost of, of managing things about 30%, and then you've got about a 10% margin. So if you think that uh, you've got a, your claims cost is essentially priced in at, at, at 30% or 30% of your total um, margin, $100 in claims needs to kind of turn out at $300 in premium. And then you come along, then government adds in New South Wales and particularly somewhere between 30 and 40% on top of that. So you've got a $100 repair that's now coming it could look like something like about $400 cost to the owner's corporation. Mm. Whereas if you pay it yourself for $100, 10% GST, claim that back, that's your cost, and you've got a clean claims history. And that's mm. one of the things insurers at the moment are really um, looking for. Those owner's corporations that have a clean claims history are getting the best prices. They're getting the best deals. The ones with claims histories and problems are, uh, is where all the big increases are starting to come through. And I wonder, is it, Paul, that um, there is, you know, we, we're in such a booming sector, there is enough, there are enough buildings out there for our relatively small, I don't know, would you say relatively small number of strata insurers to have enough business to not want to deal with the difficult buildings, if you like, or those with the poor claims history, so that when our strata managers are requesting quotes from insurers and they're only getting uh, that one insurer willing to quote, whereas previously they got at least three, uh, is that because our strata insurers insurers are sitting there quite comfortably saying, you know what, we don't need the headache. There's enough of you out there. Yeah, well, our primary responsibility, of course, is an insurer. So in, in, our, in our model, we, we've, we, we operate under the license of Valiance and, and we're borrowing their capital and we've got to give them a return on that capital. So uh, we have to make an insurance profit over a cycle, not every year, but we've got to make it over a, a cycle. So where, where we see buildings with inherent um, defective problems exacerbated by um, storms and other weather events, we can't predict the total cost of it. It's almost impossible to, to price. Mm -hmm. So we, we will say no. Um, but we also try and work very closely, particularly with strata managers, um, brokers where we've got a bigger portfolio and we can kind of, um, if I could say, have a look at the broader portfolio performance and 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 use that as leverage from time to time but mm, a bad like building it. is a bad building yeah, okay? yeah. and a strata manager uh, and they can negotiate as brokers can can negotiate some leverage for individual owners that they could mm. otherwise get on their own so um and that's been you know that's a practice that's been around for a long time mm. uh, there's a lot of loyalty in the strata insurance yes. market yeah um, it is often i've seen recently it's often only the incumbent that will uh, give that quote to a difficult building yes yeah well so loyalty from the insurer side i'm saying <laughs> yeah no 100 percent. and and of course that's also exacerbated by if there's been a big event and i say this to everyone don't, don't take the if you've got an insurer who's paying a claim and rebuilding part of your building don't go and place it with another insurer i mean yeah. you're just opening yourself up to exposure, show some loyalty. And that's the thing that's starting, I think coming back a little bit more, one of the things the pandemic's done, there's less shopping around and 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 more support, I think. I'm starting to see that of, of incumbent insurers and I think that's a good thing. Mm. Uh, I am seeing, I agree with you, by the way. Uh, I am seeing a question there from Gary about uh, inquiring as to the status of the New South Wales emergency bill. Uh, and, and Richard has already jumped in and answered that. Thank you, Richard. Um, uh, Richard is pointing us to the COVID, New South Wales COVID changes uh, on the government website and pointing to oh, our pubs media release. Thank you very much, Richard, the one that I missed today. Uh, but Gary, on our happy hour last week, uh, I directed everybody to the legislation that had been passed just the day before um, the Act had received assent, assent and was in force from the 14th of May in New South Wales, which was our COVID emergency uh, powers legislation. Uh, I haven't got my 
hand on it at the moment, um, but I will come back and put the link there for you. That is the legislation that introduced Section 271A into our Strata Schemes Management Act in New South Wales and allows uh, us to make regulations, allows our parliament to make regulations under that section to deal with uh, COVID issues in our strata schemes. So meetings, levies, perhaps interest on unpaid levies, the kind of thing that we're seeing happening in Queensland now. So I hope that answers your question. I will come back and put a link to that legislation into uh, a response to your comment there. And thank you, Richard, for giving us that additional link as well. Um, Natalie is saying, Paul, it's just so important to make this message clear. It is more expensive to claim. Yep, I'm, I'm very glad that we're hitting that one on the head. Uh, now, I want to get into uh, a rather curly one, Paul. Uh, Rena and I have discussed this one on the podcast a couple of times now, um, and I'm interested to get your take on it. This relates to a, uh, a lot owner who has suffered some damage to their lot property. Say, for example, it is a water leak from the owner's dishwasher above and it has leaked down through the kitchen and it has damaged the ceiling or even worse it's damaged some some uh, fixtures in the kitchen of the lot below it's damaged maybe the floorboards it hasn't damaged there's no damage to common property there is damage only to lot property uh, and the lot owner is saying to the owners corporation well the building insurance policy because it is a generous policy it is a broad policy it covers these parts of my lot property and you owners corporation should lodge a claim because I will be covered for the costs of fixing this um, now if the owners corporation says no it's not common property it's an issue between the two lot owners we don't want to impact our premium we don't want to make this claim and says no we're not making the claim uh, the question is can a lot owner force an owner's corporation to make a claim so that they can be indemnified for their lot property losses now I had said in a discussion with Rena on the podcast uh, I didn't believe that the owner's corporation could be forced to make a claim uh, at any stage whether it was damage to the common property damage to lot property sure they might be covered but they can decide if they don't want to claim and don't want to affect their premium uh, and we had had some comments under that podcast episode uh, questioning that and saying well isn't the lot owner a beneficiary under the policy and under some relevant uh, federal insurance legislation, couldn't that lot owner uh, force the owners corporation to make that claim? And we do have a provision in our Strata Schemes Management Act that allows owners to go to the tribunal and seek orders um, forcing an owners corporation to make a claim. So um, look, I did give you a heads up on that one, Paula, and we had a little chat about it earlier. Um, have you got thoughts on that from the insurer's side? Do you see these kinds of um, questions coming up um, well, we do but not it's not often and every sic single situation that I've been involved in is different and I've, I've, it's very hard to give a generic answer to some of those questions because there's a, a lot of facts that, that um, depend and I would argue even in the example you gave the simplistic example you gave um, there's been damage through the common property in in terms of uh, coming into the lot owners if you're talking about you know one lot above and one lot below and again that common property depends on which jurisdiction you're in so yeah. there there is some implications but let, let's put aside the circumstances can a lot owner as a beneficiary um do they have an entitlement to claim under a, a strata policy uh, ultimately um yes they can i think they can um but the process of course is our client ultimately and what we're underwriting is that legal entity the owners corporation um there's a there's a protocol and there may be reasons why an owners corporation may not want to make a claim on the policy um but if they choose not to do that the question is should they be repairing uh the damage um that's been caused by this event um regardless so uh, there's there's lots of pieces that go into that um very hard to give a generic answer 
Yeah, and I know we have uh, some some rather large brains, strata brains here. Mm. Uh, I can tell from the names that I'm looking at. Uh, if anybody wants to pitch in with your thoughts on that as well, I think it, it is a complex issue. As far as I have looked at recent cases in the tribunal under the relevant section of our Strata Schemes Management Act where uh, an owner can apply to the tribunal for an order forcing the owner's corporation to make a claim, I haven't seen any reported cases. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of them. Uh, yeah. But there is also, as well as our... We, you know, we sometimes forget as strata lawyers, and I said it on the podcast this week talking to Nikki Jovakik, uh, we have to remember that we're, we're lawyers before we're strata lawyers and not to forget to have a look at other pieces of legislation yeah. like the Insurance Contracts Act or whatever it might be that may well be relevant. Yeah, no, 100%. 100%. And, and, and look, there is definitely an insurable interest. If you go way back, <laughs> there's an insurable interest for a lot owner yeah. and a policy that they're involved in. But there's protocols there. And by the way, the example, that the thing that I didn't mention that flashes to mind, we talk about a water leaking from one apartment into another apartment. That says to me, maintenance. That says to me, that's happened over a long period of time. That's mm -hmm. not necessarily fortu fortuitous and uh, really is it an insurance issue anyway. Mm, yep. Very, all very good questions. And yes, very much uh bound by the facts of each scenario uh there is a comment here i'm seeing from stuart we might be, not be able to see all of it on the screen uh but there you go an endorsement for paul who makes it his and strata community insurance's business to educate their strata manager partners and body corporate customers indeed and i, I see that as i said earlier uh, not everybody would have been here then uh but i was referring to uh us in the sector missing your regular forums that you put on paul through sci i know at least a couple of times a year in sydney we get together uh, and you have some expert speakers there for us, filling us in on relevant issues, whether it be building defects uh, or whatever it may be the issue of the day. Um, there, there's certainly lots to talk about. We're just doing it in a different way. Yeah, uh, um, just I should mention on that because our, our autumn forum that we had scheduled that got postponed because of COVID, uh, we've filmed that. We've actually done this uh, when awesome. we get our people back together. We've filmed it. We're preparing a package now, so um, that will be released hopefully in the coming uh, couple of weeks. And we've actually gone back a step and talked a lot about the 101s of insurance, both right. on the underwriting side and also on the claim side. Uh, Michael Turnbull, our claims manager, has gone into a lot to talk about how they see the claims and approach the claims, um, which is the real important stuff that a lot of strata managers and owners want to know about. Yeah, indeed, especially if uh, you might not be as experienced uh, a strata manager, you might be new to strata management. Um, 101, insurance 101 sounds like an excellent place to be starting. Uh, I am seeing a question here from Ro. I haven't read the whole thing, so we'll see how we go, but I'm putting it up on the screen there. Ro's in New South Wales, uh, and our strata manager gets our insurance policy from a broker. The owners corporation has resolved to cease the relationship with our broker. We understand this will free up the owners corporation to go and get our own quotes, either from other brokers or directly from insurers. Is that your understanding? That's the question. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, the question that is fine. If if you've if you've been in a contractual relationship with one broker and that ceased, then yes, you're free to source your insurance quotes from a number of different channels. Um, you know, I, I, this like any profession, um, you know, there's good insurers, bad insurers, good insurance brokers, bad insurers, good lawyers, bad lawyers. People have different experiences, and and you know, it's it's good to um, it's good to be able to um, have a broader perspective. Mm. And if you find, Ro, uh, again, uh, I think whether it was Rena and myself or perhaps talking uh, to um, Heather Lander on the podcast, who is a broker, talking about the job that brokers should be doing. And if you find that they're not doing that job and they're not adding that extra um, benefit, they're not adding that value uh, for which they are paid a commission, um, then, yeah, you can absolutely go your own way. And I can see further in your comment there, Ro, you said that we, you've withdrawn much of the delegated authority that the strata manager once had so for sure yep you can have your strata manager organizing your insurance you can have a broker you can be doing it directly um, good on you for working out what works best for your scheme 
Uh, I am seeing a comment here from Natalie saying it could be a matter of submissions to SCA to update the legislation. Um, yeah, I, I would say there, Nat, you're talking about this lot owner claim against the owner's corporation policy and in what circumstances can we do that. Um, just on that, in practice, we do see, and managers, you'll you'll know this, at least in New South Wales, um, buildings who want to pass bylaws that say, sure, if a lot owner, uh, if, a, if a lot property event is covered under our policy, we will lodge we will facilitate the claim but the lot owner can pay the excess on the policy because they're getting the sole benefit um, they can pay the excess lodge the claim and we have a bylaw that says that that allows us to do it um, managers you might you might back me up here that that's, that's becoming an increasingly common thing to do um, what do you think Paul do, are you you might not see that side of it uh, when it comes to shifting the responsibility for the excess um, look, uh, we, we see it in different ways in different jurisdictions. Um, you know, for, for in, in some places, uh, you know, um, th there can be a bylaw that says that if it's a, a damage or cost a single property that they pay the excess. My personal view overall is the excess is a shared, I, I mean, it's a shared cost. And people yeah. look at a $1,000 excess and say, oh, I can't afford a $1,000 excess. Well, it's thousand dollars divided by 10 lots so it's actually a hundred dollar excess each and i think the capacity for most owners corporations to take higher deductibles and reduce their overall premiums which reduces the taxes you pay on those premiums mm. is a pretty important case because overall deductibles are still fairly low across the industry and mm. you know if you're a 20 lot 30 lot scheme you should be able to afford two thousand five thousand dollar excess and yeah. you know, to me, that funding that is is not unaffordable if if in the event you have a claim or two during a year. And where perhaps today your neighbour benefits from the owners' corporation paying that excess, you down the track will benefit from the owners' corporation paying that excess. One hundred percent. Yeah. One hundred percent. And it's it. You are, by the way, you when they say, "Oh, it's the owners' corporation and me." That's real estate sales. I'm sorry. That's what got you to buy the property. <laughs> you are the owners corporation. You're in there. You're a member of that. It is your entity. Okay. You share in the assets and you share in the liabilities. So do participate mm -hmm. um, because it's not us and them. So true. Now we only have, surprisingly, it always comes around fast, only a couple of minutes left, Paul. Uh, I can see some more questions coming through there. I'm not sure if we will get to them all. Uh, Paul, if there was anything that you wanted to add that we haven't got to yet, um, yeah. feel free to jump in. Yep. Yeah, just 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 one thing. I'd, I'd, I'd like to kind of remind all, all, all the guys that are connected with us today is, is insurance, and the regulators forget this sometimes, insurance is downstream. Right, we're in a risk business, okay, and the owners, the strata managers are helping, you know, um, the committees for the time being manage the risks of owners' corporations. And some of that risk you will try and eliminate, right? Some of that risk you will um, retain, like a, an excess is a, an example of retention of the business. Elimination of a risk is like fixing the problem and taking it away. And then some of that risk you will transfer through an insurance policy. So, you know, insurance is only one part of this risk management role that that uh, the leadership of strata managers um, deal with. And I think we've also got to remember the other two pieces because we have a, a massive public health and safety issue still remaining in this industry. Uh, the defects, the cladding, the defective fire safety systems that were in, that we've got all the media leading up to Christmas is still there now and we've got you know years of remediation to fix those problems so we've got people living in buildings that are still a public health and safety risk and we've got to get back to dealing with risk eliminating risk and reducing risk to make our community safe and that's where the focus needs to return in my view Mm, yes, uh, and it, and that is something that after the fog of COVID, it was there before, it will be there afterwards. Um, we'll be back there. All right. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, I can see there, there are a lot more questions here, and I am going to do my best to come back in here this evening. Uh, I've only gotten halfway through my glass, so, you know, I am certainly... <laughs> Still able to be answering questions uh, and do my best, and otherwise I will be flicking them <laughs> over to you, Paul. Uh, but no 
you have just been a, a font of knowledge as you always are when we have these chats paul thank you and if you are tuning in and you have enjoyed this and you like what paul has delivered you like what we're doing here on happy hour please do give us a thumbs up give us a love heart give us a smiley face uh it helps us to reach more people on facebook if we are sending that message that this is good stuff that people need to be hearing uh, i am seeing a lot of thank yous there uh in the comments uh, uh roa saying as usual a brilliant happy hour thank Thank you very much, Ro, uh, and a lot of um, uh, affirmation there for what you're saying, Paul, in relation to um, the maintenance and uh, shifting of responsibility. Absolutely. So thank you. I have very much enjoyed my Friday afternoon, uh, warming up with the red here in chilly Sydney uh, and enjoying. I told you guys I was going to, there have been lots of you tuning in. I'm looking at these numbers. Strata Insurance, very, very fun. <laughs> well, it can be, and and just just as I, I we do close down, I'd, I'd like to also recognise uh, what we do doesn't happen without good people. Grant Taylor, Samantha Lightfoot was on the, and a few of our other staff, Mick Turn, Turnbull, um, they make it happen. Um, so I want to thank them personally for uh, all their contributions in helping our strata managers out. Absolutely. And I look forward to seeing you, Paul, and all of your team in person. Hopefully, we can be one of the 50 in a large Sydney pub sometime <laughs> soon. In person. <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. See ya.